name's John Phyllis. I'm a Lancashire County Councillor. I was Head of Highways and Transport from 2013 to 2017. If you don't understand me because of my broad Lancashire accent, just put your card up and I'll slow down a bit because I do tend to speak a bit quick. Now, what have I done in the local area? Because that's important to look at. I was the person responsible for signing the checks and overseeing the Hesham Link or the Bay Gateway. I also was the person who established the, di not dial ride the bus link service from the motorway into the city centre. And unfortunately, I had to shut down some buses. And also, I had the opportunity to create more buses up by the grammar school there. So I have been in and around Lancashire for some time, and I was the person who signed off the Lancashire and Morecambe Highways and Transport Plan in 2016. Now, one of the interesting things about that plan, and I think you should all take uh, a lot of time to consider this, was looking at Morecambe, looking at Silverdale, looking more towards the top end of Lancashire and Cumbria. But with the introduction of the Eden Project, I believe this opens up not only that area, but the whole of Lancaster, Morecambe, the whole lot, to look at a futuristic transport system. Because if you're gonna have an Eden project that's gonna attract not only millions of pounds, but millions of people, they will wanna see transport of the future. And I believe you should not settle for anything less. How can this be achieved? One of the things in transport is an integrated transport system. I can go to any pub in Lancaster with my credit card and get a pint of bitter. I can use that same card in Ormskirk, where I'm from, Manchester and anywhere. But I can't get a ticket that will get me onto a train or a bus. Even on the train when I come here tonight, I was sitting there in Preston and the next thing they said, if you've got a ticket which is Northern or Cross or something like that, you can't get on the train. Get off. You can only get on this train if it's Advanti. I think it is the new name they've got now. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous way to run a system, a transport system, which if we are going to switch from cars to public transport, we need to make it convenient and easy for people to do. They've done it in London for years, and everybody says, oh, but London's different. No, it isn't. People get on buses, people get on trains. They use both. That's it. We have smart watches, we have smartphones, we have smart televisions, we have smart cards, and we have a stupid transport system. Now, as far as I can see, there is a place for the private sector, but only if the private sector works with us. One of the difficulties we have is getting that smart system in place. I think when I was actually looking at transport, there was something like about 40 different operators across Lancashire. I'm not sure Tom may be able to help us there how many are working across Lancaster and Morecambe area, but all those private operators should be working on a similar system where you can get on and you can pay and you can go. Because if we're gonna get people out of their cars, first of all, it has to be at the right price. It has to be reliable. It will turn up when people want it to turn up. It has to be convenient. So if you are in a village outside, if you are on the edge of town, you have to have a part of public transport near you. And the other thing on public transport, it has to be comfortable. You have to be able to get a seat if you need one. So all these things, if we're looking for the future, all our transport systems must be saying that to everyone that you can use that system no matter what. When I was uh, 20 or 21, I lived in a place called Sheffield. I don't know if anybody who, who was there around the 1980s, the early 80s. You could actually go on a bus and it was 2p. And you could even go till 3, 4 in the morning and it was 10p. It was cheap. It was there, it was convenient. It ticked all the boxes. And when I was there, none of my mates had a car. We didn't need one. 
But all my mates back in Liverpool all had cars. It's a case of persuasion. People say to me, oh, well, we'll ban cars, we'll, we'll do this. You can't. As a politician, you wouldn't last five minutes. And those who supported cars would get in. If we say we want a great public transport system, people will support that. And I believe we can take that message forward. And it has to be fully integrated. We look at the likes of Manchester, trams, trains, buses, all operating, all working, all building their town. So it's a case of transport will build for the future. Your local council, uh, Lancaster City Council, they themselves have a great input into this these decision making. They themselves, by organising this group, show their commitment to what they're doing. We have a situation coming forward called the bus bill. And you may have heard that Liverpool and Manchester are setting up a franchise system for the buses. The problem is, again, Liverpool and Manchester will have two different systems. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, they'll have two different sets of operators. I believe it's a Reaver in one and Stagecoach in the other, something like that. But even so, the system should be the same. If we hear politicians talk about transport for the north, we can't even do transport for the northwest. So it's up to the local politicians to actually start banging the drum in these areas and say, no, we want a fully integrated system because with that, not only will we improve the environment, we'll also improve public health because situations or the statistics actually say those who use public transport are usually healthier. And you can imagine why, because you walk for your bus, you walk away from the bus and you don't just come out your house to get in the car. So all these things and the work you're doing says it's the way forward. It's the best way forward for ourselves economically and also for our health and well-being. So as far as I'm concerned, what we need, and I'll, I'll repeat it again because this message has to go out, we have to keep on saying it, it has to be the right price. I think Luxembourg has just made it free, but that doesn't mean it's free. People have to pay through their taxes and other things. But if it's the right price, people will use it. If it's like convenient, in other words, you can actually get a bus, people will use it. If it's reliable, so you're not late for work, and I think we've had situations at train stations where people couldn't get, get to work because of the trains being late with the timetable all messed up. So it has to be reliable and it has to be comfortable. I can go from Liverpool to London and I can't get a seat on the train, but I can go from London to Brussels and I get a seat every time. How come they can go with those trains where you get a seat? And it's just the same price. There's nothing, and it's one of these super trains. So there you go. The other thing people talk about, and I'll say this quick because it's short, is HS2. Is HS2 a good thing? Yes, it is. It gives us far more capacity on our rail system, which will take more cars out of that system. Because if we don't have that, we'll be looking for more roads and more people will be using them. We need to start building for the future. And part of that building is investment in trains, in buses and other forms of public transport. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gillian Annabel. I'm a professor of transport and energy at the University of Leeds. That sounds like it's very te technical, but actually the work that I do is all about trying to understand how we can change our transport system to make it uh, more environmentally friendly, not just carbon emissions, but all kinds of environmental impacts about the way in which transport impacts us with air quality, those, those other pollutants that, it, that it's responsible for, and the land it takes up. And I do that by really trying to understand behaviour and lifestyles and what transport actually means to people and how it enables us to do the things that we do. Because you can't really look at transport without thinking about how everything around us is planned so that actually for so many of us, we're dependent on the car. 
uh, and a lot of the things are, are against us in terms of trying to change that um, because of where we put houses, um, because of the different costs, the, the cost signals, the unfair uh, situation whereby public transport fares have been going up um, year on year above inflation, but motoring costs actually haven't. I look at all those, those wider impacts. So I want to do just, just three things tonight. I say just, but. Um, firstly, I do just want to zoom just back out just to make sure that we all realise what we're talking about in terms of transport and carbon emissions and its contribution to the climate. And secondly, I want to talk about the main trade-off as I see it in terms of trying to solve that. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, where, what that is and then why that leads me to the third thing, which is to say that the solutions that we've got to look at are actually broader than I think sometimes a lot of us talk about. So f the first thing to say, and I'm sure you've, you've, you've perhaps heard some of this background information, but the transport sector in the UK, in the UK-wide, so not just talking about Lancaster, but it will be similar here, the transport sector is responsible for a third of greenhouse gas emissions. And that includes all the stuff we do as for personal travel, uh, shop, sh going shopping, working, etc. It includes freight transport. It includes surf. Uh, in, sorry, it includes um, yes, yeah, surface modes, but also airplanes. And that third, that figure of a third of carbon emissions also includes the trips we do abroad by ships or by planes. So it's a very comprehensive picture of what what transport, the impact of transport is. But I do just want to say that what it doesn't include is the energy that is. Uh, that is required to, to uh, build and manufacture the vehicles that we use. It doesn't include the energy that's, that's uh, required to generate any electricity. We put in any electric vehicles or trains. Um, and so there are wider impacts that, that, that even that third doesn't include. And it is the only sector in the UK where emissions are still rising and the only sector where emissions are greater now than they were in 1990. And 1990 is just a year that is often used to try and track our progress. So as, as a country, we've, since 1990, we've reduced our emissions by over 40%, our greenhouse gas emissions, but the transport sector has not reduced it at all. Um, and actually, in the last couple of years, emissions have started to rise again. So it really is a sector, uh, that sector and agriculture, by the way, are the two sectors where emissions have, have risen. They're, they're the re really knotty problem, a really, really big problem. And you can encapsulate that problem by saying we've had technological progress. Our cars are more efficient weight for weight than they were 20, 30 years ago. It's just that our cars have got heavier and we are using them more. So the technological progress, and this happens, has happened throughout many vehicles or types of travel, uh, the technological progress has been overtaken, has been negated by the fact that we're using them more or using more heavy or, uh, vehicles, for instance. So I see the, the two solutions. There's two main solutions. One solution is we have to get the fossil fuels, the petrol, diesel, jet fuel, out of our vehicles that are in the transport system. That's one main, main route of doing it. And the second main route is that we have to reduce the amount that we use those vehicles. Now, if we do number one, the getting the fossil fuels out really quickly, or we could say the quicker we do that, the less we have to restrict the amount that people can use it. And that is the trade-off. That is what we are talking about in terms of reducing climate emissions. Uh, from the transport sector. That's the two main ways. Obviously, each of those branches uh, can encompass a huge amount of different sub-solutions, if you like, underneath that. When we talk about personal travel, which understandably is, will be the focus, I imagine, of most of your, your discussions, and often is, within uh, the modes that we, modes of transport, the means of transport that we use, cars are responsible for the majority of, mis of emissions. So about 60% of our personal travel um, is, um, um, sorry, more than that actually, um, about 75% 70, of our personal travel is responsible, uh, is taken up by cars. 
and they, those emissions have started to rise. And we talk an awful lot about the solution to that being electric vehicles. So even at the local level, there's a big push to put in charge points, to encourage things like having free car parking and so on, to encourage electric vehicles. But there's still a very small proportion of the sales. So at the moment, they're about 4% of all the new cars that are sold are electric. Um, but only about half a percent of the cars actually out on the road are electric. So what happens is you have this time lag. So even if tomorrow, every single person from tomorrow bought an electric car who bought a new car, it would take about 15 years before every single car out there was electric because cars stay on the road. So when you've heard about the government saying, right, from 2035 or whatever date they're going to choose today, whichever way the wind is blowing, um, uh, we're going to ban the sale of petrol and diesel cars. That still means that for another 15 years beyond that date, you'll be able to buy petrol and diesel cars in the second-hand market. There will be petrol and diesel cars out there, okay? So it's not this really quick solution, because at the same time that we're selling 4% of electric cars, we're selling almost a quarter of all the cars that are sold are SUVs. And SUVs are... A 10 times more polluting than an electric car. So we're actually looking over here at this part of the market and getting excited about it, or some of us are, and ignoring this huge problem that's swamping the progress that we're making on the other end of the market. So that means actually what we really need to do in the car market, and this is a national policy more than it is a local policy, is we need to stop selling the most polluting cars right now. We can do that right now without actually, we might harm choice, people's choice in buying cars, but not so much restrict how much they're used. Now let's come to how much cars are used or, or any forms of transport are used. When we think about the solutions locally, we are often thinking quite rightly about how we can change car trips to other modes of transport. And we focus on buses a lot, we focus on walking and cycling a lot, all great things, but I, there's something I just want to say which is quite difficult to hear. Public transport is only responsible for about 5% of the carbon emissions that we do. Cycling and walking, because they are undertaken at the moment on very short trips, and if we keep thinking about them in that way, particularly cycling, which we could start to think about as taking up much longer trips, particularly with electric bikes, but if we keep in this mindset of short trips, they are actually not going to do a great deal for carbon emissions. They are particularly not going to do a great deal if the people that start to get on the buses and start to get on the bikes don't actually come directly from car trips. And we know from research and we know from all the, all the examples around the world that we can improve the buses, we can improve the cycleways, we can make public transport free and car users won't go in their droves across to those modes unless we also make motoring a lot more expensive. It is a hard truth, but it is a fact. We have to have sticks and carrots. Um, so that is one of my main messages. And then finally, thank you, and then finally, I said I wanted to just try and sort of make sure we are thinking quite broadly about the types of solutions um, that we could look at and think about. So I'm going to give you three types of solutions quickly. I'm going to categorise them because I think this is quite helpful. So this, this categorisation is called avoid, shift and improve. A bit like the waste hierarchy, where you have reduce, uh, recycle and remove, or whatever it is, I've forgotten it now, but avoid, shift and improve. So avoiding sounds negative, but it's about avoiding travel. It's about organising the services where we put things, not closing local post offices, putting local post offices back, not building houses in the middle of nowhere, in order to reduce the need to travel in order to reduce the need to travel by any mode, but particularly by car. And those things, are made, the solutions there are mainly in the planning system. It's what we do with planning. Shifting are all the things that we talk about in terms of trying to improve the alternatives, cycleways, bus priority routes, changing the ticket pricing, making ticketing more integrated, simple, etc. But also, as I say, 
in conjunction, you, those are the, the carrots, you have to have the sticks, increasing motoring costs. And now there are things that can be done at the, the local level around that, putting public transport levy on businesses or workplace place, place parking <coughs> charges, which generate revenue at the local level and give the local level much more power over their revenue, because when government generates money this way, they keep it and they decide how it's spent. But if it's generated locally, much more power to actually improve things locally. And then finally is improving. And they are things like getting the most polluting cars off of the road. A lot of those things are done at the national level, regulatory instruments and so on to stop us from buying or selling certain cars. But at the local level, you can have parking policies that make electric vehicles free or um, charge more for the most polluting cars. So there are things at the local level to improve the fleet and also improving uh, buses and getting electric buses on the road. So avoid, shift and improve and a whole load of things that you can think about, not just buses and, and, and cycling. Okay, thanks. Nice. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm Tom Waterhouse. I'm the Operations Director for Stagecoach in Cumbria and North Lancashire. Uh, so my role is to, I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day delivery of all of our public transport services across the, or bus services across the five depots that we run in our business, which is Carlisle, Workington, Kendall, Barrow, and here in Morecambe and Lancaster. Um, I've just listened to those two and, and I, I, I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to spend the next five minutes defending the bus. Um, and arguing quite passionately for the bus and why I think the bus is the solution. Because some of the things that you've been told, firstly, I don't agree with, and secondly, are just simply not true. Um, but just to, just to put in some context, really, that you know, why we think bus is the solution is that here in Morecambe and Lancaster, we have an excellent track record we have proven that when you make bus a better choice, people will actively choose to use it without there being any other external factors. And a good example of that is that those of you who are, are local have been around a while will remember that back in 2018, we made some quite significant changes to our bus network in Markham and in Lancaster. And that coincided with the reopening of the Greyhound Bridge. So what we did with our network is that we made journey times a lot faster going from Morecambe into Lancaster and a lot faster doing end-to-end -end journeys from Lancaster back into Morecambe. At the same time, the congestion situation in the city drastically improved because Greyhound Bridge reopened, traffic went back to some sort of normality uh, and we didn't see the, the significant levels of congestion that we had seen for the 12 or 18 months previously. So what you had there is you had a situation where positive changes have been made to the network, but the reality is that if you're a, a private car driver, your life actually got a damn sight easier at the same time. So what was the result of that network change? Well, the result is that we saw a 5% increase in the number of journeys that people were taking on all of our services just in Morecambe and in Lancaster. And what that means, to put that in context, is that that's an extra, over 12 months, 285,000 journeys more were made on buses compared to what had happened before the network change. So, where we talk about people have to be forced to use public transport and have to be forced to use buses, I would argue, based on this very local specific example, that that actually simply isn't true. Well, I didn't interrupt, well, I didn't interrupt so, but I think it's worth just giving you a balanced story from an actual operator who runs public bus services. I think the other thing that that the industry can do and the industry already does do is, ta is invest in new vehicles. So, you know, some of you may have seen that last September, the industry body that represents us, which is the Confederation of Passenger Transport, all 95% of the operators in this country who are, member, who are members of the CPT, and they're committed that from 2025, the industry will only buy 
ultra low or zero carbon buses. So any bus that enters the industry from that 95% of operators, bearing in mind that includes us, Stagecoach, we're the largest UK bus operator in the country, there's First Bus, there's Go Ahead, there's Arriva. So of all of that, that takes about 80% of the UK bus market and 80% of all journeys made on public transport from 2025 will be done on ultra low or zero emission carbon vehicles. And last year alone, just in Morecambe and Lancaster, we replaced 47% of our entire double deck fleet in this, in this uh, network with at six point, over six million pound with Euro 6 latest ultra low carbon technology. I just want to touch very quickly, I'm conscious I've only got 30 seconds, but I think it's important I just try and address the comments made about franchising. I'm a private operator, clearly I don't agree with it, but there's some things in there that simply I, I would have a slightly different slant on, and I think it's important you understand that. Franchising is held up, and London is often held up, as the panacea of how to run public transport, and it's the solution to get more people to use it, and it's the solution to, to what we're here to the climate change tonight. What people don't tell you is that in London, the public purse has to put £700 million more into the system than what it gets back in revenue. And over the last five years, passenger numbers, public transport numbers on buses in London have actually started to drop. So, you know, I just want to, one final thing, and then I will finish conscious of time, but I think it's a really interesting fact is this. Across the country, if everyone switched just one car journey a month to bus, there will be one billion few car journeys and a saving of over two million tonnes of CO2 per year. So for me, bus is a big part of the solution. Thank you very much. My name's Brian Cookson. I'm a, a board member um, of Active Lancashire, which is an organisation that's trying to get more people involved in sport and leisure activity and, uh, and thereby get a healthier lifestyle. Um, for 17 years I was the president of British Cycling and then I did four years as president of the International Cycling Union, so I think and hope I've got a bit of an international perspective on it, although I do come from the sporting side, I do appreciate that not everybody is going to be interested in cycling as a sport. And one of the things about the sport of cycling is you can't practice it without being a cyclist on the roads, on the public highways, and experiencing all of the uh, good things and the bad things about that. And we, uh, we all like to be out in the countryside and so on uh, until we're all um, you know, uh, harassed, as it were, by an overtaking vehicle or, or, or whatever. So those are the downsides of, of, of cycling. But w what I wanted to try and bring into this discussion was something about that it's not just about environmental pollution and CO2 emissions and so on, it's about your health, our health as well. And you know, one of the simplest things we can do is get out of our cars, even off our buses and off our trains, and try and ride a bike or walk to work, walk to school and so on. Now, you know, uh, I'm of an age where I went to school on my bike every day for the whole of my school career, but now, You've only got to walk past any school at, at, at in time or out time to see dozens and dozens of cars running, waiting for their little uh, darlings to be picked up from school, polluting the environment and so on. You know, and I have a lot of sympathy with Greta Thunberg and her school strikes and all the rest of it, but one good thing that you kids could do would be to walk to school or ride your bikes to school and so on. So what I'm trying to say here is that a lot of this is in our own hands. Certainly, uh, if we can walk or ride a bike, you don't have to do it every day. If you just ride a bike to work one day a week, uh, you've saved 20% of your commuting costs and so on. So I think what I'm trying to say as well is that, that all of that has to be seen in context. And if you look at those countries where cycling and walking to work and school are part of uh, the normal daily life, it's because those things have become normalized and because there has been investment over a long period of time in the facilities that make that easier than the options. So, you know, I was in Utrecht uh, in, uh, in Holland a, a couple of years ago. I've been in Copenhagen. And the numbers of people that you see riding bikes is astonishing. And 
when they get to the school, when they get to the railway station, when they get to the bus station. There are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of places to park your bike securely. If you go all the way to work or school, there are showers and facilities, a place for storing your bike safely again, and all of those things. And that's not an accident. That's happened because the governments encourage the local authorities, the cities and the, and the towns, the counties, to invest in those kind of facilities over a long period of time. And they have uh, transformed the way in which people uh, go to work. People travel on a daily basis. Now, I don't think that's too difficult for us to do uh, as a nation. Uh, I think there are uh, signs that the, the tide is turning, if I can use that um, analogy. But I think we're still quite a long way away from making sensible decisions about what, uh, what's a proportionate amount of our national uh, economy to put into cycling and walking. Now, you know, we don't seem to have difficulty finding billions and billions of pounds for high-speed rail, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not uh, talking against that, but we can't find a few million to invest in integrated cycling and walking routes, which would, to me, not only have a beneficial effect in terms of climate change, um, the environment generally, CO2 emissions, but it would have a beneficial effect on all of our health, uh, all of our vitality and cut down on costs of the National Health Service and so on. Because if you look at the National Health Service now, the majority of expenditure is because of the obesity crisis, uh, the poor, um, healthy, uh, unhealthy lifestyles and all that kind of thing. So I think what uh, I will put to you is that cycling and walking are an absolutely vital part of an integrated transport system for Lancaster. And <laughs> Good evening everyone, my name is Sandra Cossum Shea and I'm the owner and managing director of SCS Logistics based at Heesham. Without HGVs, heavy goods vehicles, you would be naked, hungry and homeless. 97.6% of everything you touch, eat, wear, sit on, lie on, walk on, comes on the back of a heavy goods vehicle. I'm not sure where the rest comes in, the other two point whatever percent, a magic carpet or a van or a push bike, I don't know very easy to get us off the, the road, stop buying. The economy of the country would fall over. You can produce what you want, but unless it gets from A to B, it's pointless. We have an insatiable appetite for same day and next day deliveries. We get the society that we deserve. We are, all of us, Greedy. Every time we buy something synthetic, mass produce, your lettuce in Sainsbury's, we have put a heavy goods vehicle on the road. And I'm quite pleased that you do. The industry, in general terms, is very responsible. Mid 90s, they started the Euro emission. So now we're at Euro 5, we're going into Euro 6, whatever. The industry has continually worked to be cleaner, safer and better. And as a whole, it's very heavily legislated. And as ex-cabin crew and ex-nursing, I would say this is the most legislated, compliant driven industry I've ever been involved in. Every wagon is inspected every six weeks so that it is safe and clean. My old girls, from our point of view that I run, they don't owe me anything and they don't owe society anything. They've got rid of their carbon footprint. My new girls that I run, um, they're very clean, they're cleaner than most cars. They're amazing, it's like dri driving an iPad. They're fabulous. My concern is that they won't last. They're not built to last. It's a throwaway society, even in 120k worth of kit. They're flimsy. That bothers me. We run very clean in so much as that I don't do empty miles. Um, we groupage all our customers' freight, take them to central hubs, and then spread them out. So my wagons are always running at capacity. I would like to see, it won't be in my lifetime, central hubs through the spine of the country 
that are fed by separate road or rail networks, where industry is contained in certain areas so that it's not, we're not flying about all over the country. Because my freight just, sometimes I think I'm sure I sent that off to Birmingham last night and it's come back again. We could be better. And then there would be cleaner vehicles feeding those central hubs to localised area. Whether that's possible or not, I don't know. I am concerned about electric vehicles when it comes to heavy goods because we have to be aware when my vehicles are taken off the road because they don't pass emission standards, they are sent to the developing world. That's not really right. They're exported. What are we doing? Lithium mines. What's going on there? How do we get rid of the batteries? If we all went electric, how many power stations are we going to plug in? I'd like to see hydrogen. We've got to be careful that in cleaning ourselves up, we don't damage the other side of the planet. We look good, but what have we left behind? How are we going to get rid of everything that we create? So getting rid of fossil fuels or using them less is fine, but let's be responsible with what we're replacing. And next time you want something from Amazon tomorrow, do you really need it? I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'm June Greenwell, I'm from Silverdale. I'm uh, one of the members of a small group of five people, four of whom are pensioners, one's definitely not a pensioner, and for the last year and a half we've been looking at bus services in the village and working with the county council um, to see what we can conclude about how you make buses better in our small area. So it's very much not an eagle-eye view of society, it's a very mouse-level view of society. What we've discovered, it's the same that several people have already said, if we're going to alter the bus service we've got to make it more popular and better used, then it's got to be a bus service that people want. And one of the things we've discovered is that people are much more likely to use the bus if they live on a bus route road. And that's particularly so for people with disabilities, people with small children, people who are a bit frail and elderly. Um, but what we also know is the bus routes in most areas, and maybe, maybe it's different with stagecoach in some, but in our area, the bus routes are historical. Nobody's actually looked at them and said, where do people live who need a bus and where can we leave it? At last, a few years ago, I moved house, or we moved house, from a road that was on the bus route and I used the bus regularly. Now I live somewhere that's half a mile from the, bus, uh, the nearest bus stop. It, there's no, we have no bus shelters in Silverdale. Um, and to be honest, I don't use the buses very often because the bus doesn't come where I wanted to go to. The other thing we've looked at hard is the timetables for buses. And I could really, really be pleased if one of the results of, of, the, of this venture is that people started thinking about who in my community would set up a link with the county council um, when they're about to revise the bus timetable. Because last year we nearly had a crisis when they are very good, I think the county council is excellent, by the way, you'll be delighted to hear, um, but they were going to, uh, they had to change one bus route, and they were going to change the one where all the kids from Lancaster who came back on the train were met by the bus. And if, if we hadn't had two women from the Women's Institute who were poring over every little bit of the timetable and feeding it back to us, we got in touch with the county, the county then changed this, said, oh, you're absolutely right, that's, we made a mistake there, got it changed. You can, you can improve small things if you have local voices that are linked to the people who provide services, and too often that's been missing. Um, so there's the, the bus... Right, OK. Just a couple of last things. We've been looking at the dial-a-ride service for pensioner shoppers, and it's hardly ever used. Why don't we extend the dial-a-ride service? It's an excellent service for children, for disabled people, and not just keep it with pensioners. And lastly, can I just add, I'm very glad I live in Lancashire, because we're on the Cumbria border, 
and Cumbria is now heavily dependent on voluntary driver schemes in, all, in smaller towns. Um, I'm very glad we're not having to look at Thank that. You. Okay.